uh, Climate Works was the first uh, group to get me interested in the short-lived climate pollutants. I had been doing uh, Montreal Protocol for a long time, but it was Hal Harvey who said, you need to do more than that. You need to do the rest of the short-lived climate pollutants as well. So thank you, uh, Climate Works. Um, Governor Brown sent, uh, set a, a very high bar today for the world with his uh, new legislation that he signed. But he started with the recognition that the world faces an existential threat. This is because Rahm has taught him that, that we are right on the edge of a different climate that we may not be able to recover from. So while we need heroic action to get to the net zero emissions and then to move to climate negative, uh, we have uh, a very long way to go. And I'll quote the governor uh, because I like this quote. He says, what we have to do takes expert engineering, and we have that for short-lived climate pollutants. It takes scientific research, and we have great research on the short-lived climate pollutants. It takes political collaboration. Well, we can see that here. We can see it with the foundations. We can see it with the CCAC coordinating nearly uh, 125 partners, including 61 governments. So we've got that, too. And then he says, and it takes great wisdom to forge ahead, not just in one administration, but in several. So I hope we also have that great wisdom. He goes on, he says, that's why I say we're like the base camp. I'm looking up at Mount Everest. We've got a very big mountain to climb. We can't make it to the top of that mountain without aggressive action on short-lived climate pollutants. Rom gave us the great tutorial, but I'll elaborate just on a couple of points. He said that the non-CO2 forcers, the short-lived climate pollutants and the long-lived non-CO2, are about half of current warming. What he didn't say is that when we look at solutions, the short-lived climate pollutants are more than twice the avoided warming at 2050 than aggressive CO2. In other words, they're more than twice as important in this next period. Now, this period is incredibly important because with the short-lived climate pollutants, we can, if we cut them aggressively, we can delay the two degrees by about two decades, and we also slow the self-reinforcing feedbacks. These are probably the weakest link in the chain of climate protection. And once we start knocking them over, like a series of dominoes, we're not going to stop. And I'll use the Arctic summer sea ice as an illustration. So what we've lost in the reflective shield that right now sends tremendous heat back into space, what we've lost in that reflectivity just between 1979 and 2011 has put 6.4 watts per square meter of warming into the Arctic. And when you average that globally, and that, that's, by the way, about twice what the global warming is today. But when you average it globally, it's about 25% as much as CO2 has put in in that period. So we've got another piece of climate forcing coming as we melt the summer sea ice. And when we finish melting that, which could be within 15 years, we'll add several times that amount of warming. Now, if you picture uh, 12, 18, watts per square meter coming to the Arctic, you can see a wicked cascade of dominoes starting to fall. We'll collapse, uh, meth we'll collapse permafrost. That will release methane and uh, more CO2. We'll kill the boreal forest. We'll slow the thermohaline heat conveyor. And the world's going to enter into a new climate that we don't want to have to deal with. It's going to be really, really tough. Well, uh, we may be at the base camp, as Governor Brown says, but we actually have scaled Mount Everest before. 
when we solved the first great threat to the global atmosphere from CFCs. So Mario Molina, sitting in the front row, our honored guest, said in 1974 with his colleague Sherry Rowland that uh, it looks like the CFCs are migrating to the upper atmosphere and destroying stratospheric ozone letting excess UVB radiation in, causing skin cancer, reducing our immune system, cataracts, I mean, tremendous health problems. But the world came together. We started with uh, boycotts. A few of you are probably old enough to remember when we stopped using underarm deodorant spray and hairspray. We had about 15 spray cans in every household at that point, propelled by CFCs. Then we did some national measures, and then we moved to the Montreal Protocol at the international level. And that sequence, including that great treaty, put the world on the path to recovering the stratospheric ozone by about 2065. It's a slow process, and Jason mentioned the CFC 11 anomaly. If we don't correct that, we're going to delay the recovery a little further. But we will correct that. We have a, a system in the protocol that will and has identified that and has started action. So what, what most people don't know is that in 1975, Rahm told us that he discovered that CFCs were also super climate pollutants. So at the same time that the Montreal Protocol was taking out these CFCs to protect stratospheric ozone, they were doing heroic work on climate change. And in fact, the amount of climate protection that we've gotten is as much and maybe more than what CO2 is causing today. So if you think about it, we have solved an amount of the climate problem equal to CO2 today with a treaty that started modestly, learned by doing, strengthened itself over and over and over. The numbers, if you're into the metrics, it could be up to 75 gigatons or billions of tons of CO2 equivalent per year that we avoided through the uh, the reduction of the CFCs. Uh, if you look at the watts per square meter, up to 1.6 watts per square meter. So again, we have been to the top of the summit. We have solved the first great threat to the global atmosphere and done more for climate through the Montreal Protocol than any other piece of climate legislation or policy. And by the way, we've done it at an incredibly modest cost. So it's been less than 10 cents a ton of CO2 equivalent. Or you could say it's zero because we did this for stratospheric ozone protection and this was purely a collateral benefit. But it's, uh, it's a hell of a benefit. Now the CCAC played a very important role in the Kigali Amendment. This is the latest iteration where we've taken the Montreal Protocol, which we refer to as a treaty that's a start and strengthen treaty. We worked very hard with uh, support from many of the funders who are here over several years to get what we now call the Kigali Amendment to phase down HFCs, the high GWP HFCs we're getting rid of. They're out of the atmosphere and the warming they would have caused is now not going to be caused. And that is up to 0.5 degrees Celsius of warming. Now, just to put that into perspective, Rom told us the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees and all of the harms that he listed there in that half a degree. That half a degree is what's going to make or break the world. So we have to work incredibly hard to get the short-lived climate pollutants to give us that extra two decades so that we can also do what we need to do on the CO2 and with carbon dioxide removal. Now, just as a final comment, uh, while, while Montreal Protocol is a, is a brilliant treaty that we all need to study, we all need to understand why it's worked, we also need to know that it can still do more. So Rachel mentioned, and, and so did Jason, 
that we're now pursuing energy efficiency of the cooling devices that use the HFCs and the substitutes that will replace them for refrigerants. Every time we've done a phase out uh, of refrigerants in the past under the Montreal Protocol, we have had the benefit of catalyzing improvements in energy efficiency. It's been a byproduct. The engineers say we're shutting down the line to change refrigerants. Let's replace the heat exchanger. Let's replace the compressor. Let's make this better. Costs have gone down. It won't cost us anymore. And we'll get a great bump for our, um, our clients who buy these things, our customers. But this time, the Montreal Protocol, with the help of the Kigali Cooling Efficiency um, Program, uh, is aiming to do more deliberate improvements in energy efficiency. The Kigali uh, uh, Cooling Efficiency Program, by the way, is a $53 million effort put together by um, the Pisces Foundation, put together by Hewlett Foundation, put together by Climate Works. Nineteen philanthropists came together in a matter of weeks at the end of the Kigali process to say, we will put a fund together to help bring this amendment across the finish line and then to improve um, energy efficiency. So I, I encourage the funders now to take that same uh, will, and uh, I'm looking at uh, David Beckman as uh, one of the great leaders here, to raise another fund that's going to be even bigger for the CCAC and for all the work on uh, the short-lived climate flutes. Thank you. Thank you.